NACDL is the association of the nation's criminal defense bar. Um, yeah, this is on. It sounds on. Good afternoon. Um, I'll try not to put you guys back to sleep after you've had lunch. So if you guys have any questions whatsoever, just raise your hand or yell at me or do whatever you want um, to get my attention. And I'll happily stop and take questions in between. So I understand there's a range of experience um, in the audience as well. So if I'm going too fast or I'm going way too slow, yell at me for that too. Um, I don't really have any ego about this. I just want to be able to give you an overview and talk um, about some specific types of digital experts and give you some pointers on what you can do when you encounter one of these guys. Um, so who here has crossed a digital expert of any kind? We got to, okay, so we have a few people. All right, and so, so many of you have not. So I'm going to talk first about some things that generally apply just to all experts. Um, there's no shortcut. You've got to study. Um, you absolutely have to learn the material. So regardless of what type of expert it is, whether it's cell phone forensics, cell site location, computer forensics, or a psychiatrist, you have to learn like the actual information. Um, you want to get publications on the forensic issue from whoever your uh, expert is. You want to read their publications. You want to read ones that they cite to. You want to read the ones that the articles that they've cited to cite to. You have to really do your homework on these. And I cannot express to you enough, if you've never crossed a particular type of expert, talk to your office about getting a consulting expert. Even if you're not calling that person to testify, you need to have somebody, get Larry, get one of these guys, and say to them, sit down with me with what these reports are. Go through these. Like you saw when Larry had a, just like the basic um, call detail records. Those are the records that you're going to get. And depending on the length of the case and how many you know, calls are out there, if it's a big conspiracy, you're going to get thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of pages of records. And even though you can look at them and understand like what the headings are and where things go, what it means to you and how it can be helpful to you is going to be a very difficult thing to do unless you have an expert that can help you, um, that can run it through their programs, put it into you know, their spreadsheets and say, Here's, here are things that make sense. Um, so don't try to do this on your own if you don't have to. Um, study who your opposing expert is. You know, what's their bio? Look at, get prior testimony. You know, NACDL is an amazing resource. Um, I'm sure you guys have listservs too. Just send out and say, who's crossed this guy? What was the testimony? Get those transcripts. Read through them and find out what worked in the other person's cross. What didn't? So you don't fall into some sort of trap because you think you found something and the expert's going to have some beautiful idea. Um, and make sure, like, is this somebody, like, bias is a huge thing. You know, prosecutors have their go-to experts. They're like, oh, it's a digital case. I'm calling that guy. Um, what that means is that that guy never testifies for the defense. Um, and you can use that against them. Why don't they? Are they biased? Are they going to look? They want to keep this cash cow of theirs, the prosecutor, happy? Look into those things. Um, so the data, data, data. You got to get all of the information. And I'll go through when we get to some of the specific things, some of the things you want to be asking for in discovery. But don't assume that what the prosecutor turns over in their initial discovery is going to be everything that's out there. The pro it might be everything that the prosecutor has, but it doesn't mean that it's everything that it e exists. Because a lot of times a prosecutor will say, hey, expert, like, look at this for me. And the expert will forward them like an eight page report. And then that's what they have. And that's what they're planning to use at trial. But the expert will have tons of background information and data. And you are entitled to every single thing that the expert looked at to form their opinion. 
So whatever went into that eight page report, you need it. And you need to get it and then you need to have probably another expert look at it. But at least at a bare minimum, you have to get it. Um, so once you've learned everything, um, you understand the field, you have all your records, you know what you're talking about. What do you have to do now? How do you formulate an actual cross-examination of any of these experts on, in your particular case? Um, number one, do you have to or can you preclude this expert? Um, you know, don't just immediately start thinking, this guy's coming. Now what do I do? I have to figure out my cross. Think ahead of time about whether or not you can keep this particular person in this particular case off the stand. Um, you know, some of these things are, if it's a scientific, if the sci it's based on science, is it actually based on science? Is the person going to be using um, real information, real data that is accepted in the scientific community? Um, the answer might be yes, but they might not want to tell you that. And you can keep people off the stand for that reason. Um, I s will point to one that is everywhere. Um, who has Google Maps on their phone? If, any, if you don't, you probably has, have Waze, which is owned by Google, and owned by Google Maps. <laughs> so they do not want to tell you the algorithms for how they do that. Because if they tell you how they calculate your location and the algorithms that are used in their map program, it's now public information. Everybody that is a competitor with Google Maps wants those algorithms. So if you file a motion challenging the science behind a Google map and saying in order to, for my expert to challenge, decide whether or not this is actual correct data, we have to have the algorithms and the data used. They will never give it to you. They would rather your case got dismissed. Um, and they won't send somebody to show up. So you subpoena them and they will move to quash. And eventually your judge is gonna say, look, you can't, if we can't prove it, you can't do it. Um, there's been success doing that in New York specifically on Google Maps, they're very proprietary about that information. So even if you assume that it is science, it doesn't mean that they have, you still, they still have to prove it, and they won't want to. Um, is it relevant? You know, don't forget this question. You know, prosecutors love when they can come in and be like, act like they're on CSI, and call their experts and do other things, but it might not matter to your case. It might be something that is just sort of a red herring that is out there. So don't forget those obvious questions. Should this be coming in in your particular case? Um, and then does the proffered expert have expertise in the relevant area? So if it's somebody, if they're just putting an FBI agent who has looked at a whole bunch of like, he's been working in like child porn cases for 20 years and he's looked at lots of these. So he's now an expert in how like, pictures are dated and other things, or where they came from, or where they were stored in a computer, challenge that. File a motion. Find out. I mean, I think, was it Larry that said, if, or Lars, was it you? Somebody, one of these two fine gentlemen earlier today said that if somebody's telling you what the date stamp, when a picture or something was actually taken, that's a true expert testimony, and they might be making it up. Um, so if it's an FBI agent or somebody else that is going to say this picture was like created and sent and stored at this particular time, taken at this time, I know it because I've seen these a thousand times, that's not true expertise. Um, so even though that person might be an expert in a thousand things, they need to be an expert in that particular narrow question that is relevant to your case. Um, so just remember that, that if, even if the field is accepted, um, the particular question might not be acceptable in your case. Keep it out. The less you have to cross these guys in front of a jury, the better off you are. That's the like, biggest first step in a cross-examination. Don't do it. <laughs> um, get rid of these guys. Um, then you want to think about how is this expert going to be used? You know, is this person actually going to hurt my case? Like, does it matter to me? Or can I, like, can I use the expert to help my case? Um, and so, but if it is relevant and it hurts your case, then you have to think about attacking it. So once you are starting your cross-examination, start with your expert first, because 
they are going to get up there and whatever they're going to say, eight million things that make them the most qualified, smartest person in the world. You know that 99% of it is crap. Um, but it sounds impressive to the jurors that are sitting there. They're like, oh, everything this person says is, must be a genius because he published a paper one time. Um, so you can go into those things. Look at the qualifications. Go through the CV. And like, if you genuinely think this person is not qualified, um, but for some reason you've lost um, your challenge ahead of time, you might want to do that in voir dire. You might want to get up during the qualifications and put that all out there in front of the jurors and start attacking that person before they even have an opportunity to do their direct testimony. You know, I mean, you know your ju the judge is probably going to let them continue their testimony, but you will have started your cross-examination before they got to start their testimony. And that can be very, very powerful. Um, but of course, like, you know, it all, like everything in trial, it's a, you know, it's a fine line, and you want to make your decision based on what's happening in your case. Because if you know ahead of time that the judge is going to overrule you, you're, and you're worried that the um, juror is going to think like, oh, that was a waste of our time, you know, you got to be careful with those things. Um, so be smart about it. But in, in a lot of situations, you want to at least ask some pointed voir dire questions to make the jurors question the person a little bit. Um, so can the testimony help you? Again. You want to focus on this. It, you might not want to fight. Even if there are some bad things in the evidence that is coming out through this juror or through the expert, you might not want to attack the expert's credibility. You might not want to attack the basis of their opinion. You might want to just look for the things that also can help your case. You can say, yeah, maybe he was there, but he's also was over here. He did this, he did that. Point out and just use them and use the information instead of actually directing your cross and attacking the person. Um, demonstrate adversarial bias. This is, I touched on this a little bit before, but um, this is just, the adversarial bias is an accepted term. People understand that, um, you know, it's basically you become an adversary instead of a neutral expert. So you are basically hired to persuade the jury at a, to a particular side. And you can demonstrate this through various different techniques in saying, pointing out that you know, in their written report or in their direct testimony, you know, they highlighted all of the things that make your client seem very, very, very guilty. But they managed to skip over these other portions. And they don't highlight them. And they don't talk about them. And they've always been paid by the prosecutor. Those are the kinds of things that you want to lump into just like the bias portion of your cross. Um, I said that already. So now when you get to um, challenging, if you have to challenge an expert on the subject matter, which again, that's the big one. That's the hardest thing to do. So whatever the subject is, you know, if you have like a DNA expert, and you know, it's like transfer DNA. You might not want to get into the loci and like what's going on and whether there were other sources. You might just want to talk about the fact that you don't, can't tell from that DNA like at what point it got onto this object. Seven other people might have touched it in between. That can be the type of cross that you do because you're only focused on the things that actually matter and not, subject, not on the subject matter. Um, all of that remains true when it's like digital evidence as well. Um, but once you have one, start with the report. Take your, that report apart. You want to take the report, and this is why you need the underlying data for any report. Because you want to take their report, their conclusions, and the data to your expert and go through both of them with it, with you, and find out whether or not their conclusions are actually sound? Are they based on the full data? Or were they picking and choosing? Um, like, for instance, I had a case. And the prosecutor, it was a kidnapping murder case of a child. And the prosecutor was really, 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 really trying to demonstrate that our client was a pedophile, despite having zero evidence, having him done nothing sexual ever. Um, and so they had an expert who went through the computer, like his home computer, 
and managed to find like in like the and we'll talk about this in a little while somewhere on the hard drive um, various things that could conceivably be used to make him seem like a sexual deviant and so they found things that were like you know searches for like vaginal pain and various different things and then the images and other things and they lump them together in order to try and make it look like all of these here's 200 images that were on his computer all related to like sex and penises and vaginas and they put them all in like one place and if you look at the report you're like oh shit my client had like hundreds of pictures on his computer that why would he have those but when you actually take the data they're from, you know, however many years worth of garbage and searches and cookies that have been piling up on a computer and aren't all in one place. So you need to take those apart and look at them and figure out what is happening and whether or not you can actually draw the conclusion that they're trying to draw. Um, so again, work with your expert. I can't stress that enough. Um, but again, don't get stuck with just with just what your expert says. Most experts, um, I don't know, I'm not gonna speak for these two, but most experts who have testified more than once in court will be able to provide you with questions, some for direct, some for, for cross, that are very technical and very, very, very helpful. But if you don't understand those questions, do not ask them. Do not ask them. You have to go through and understand what the questions mean. You need to be able to use, like, truly understand them. So if you're working off a prepared script and suddenly your expert's over here, you need to be able to go over here and not be stuck on that script. So you need to understand what the questions are, why you're asking them, and what the answers are supposed to be, so that if they don't stick to the script, you can still function. So don't use your experts and use them deeply, but they need to be a partner and a learning tool rather than a crutch. Um, so cell site location data. So figure out, the first thing is, so when you have cell site location data, and the primary, primary, primary thing that people, they use in court, and again, this was mentioned briefly earlier, is historical cell site data. A, but it is the least accurate of any of the tracking data, and it is the most ripe for cross-examination. Um, they use it most frequently because they don't need um, a search warrant, and they can get it after the fact. So they can just request records from cell site companies by subpoenas, and so the um, cell phone companies just hand them over. And then they can do it a, like a look back to try and track your location. So that's why prosecutors use it. Um, and now again, with cell site location, is do you have to attack it? Does the like, actual location of your client matter? Um, is there an alternate explanation for your uh, client being in that place? Um, or can the location data help you? Now, I say expand your view, because what the prosecutor does is finds a cell site that is like a tower near the crime, and your client's phone is there, and their only conclusion is, client was there because they committed the crime. Like, that is always their theory. That's why they're trying to introduce it into evidence. Um, but you need to look at more than that one call. So just expand your view. Look for patterns in the data, um, and try and figure out if it's a coincidence, possibly, that your client was there if he was at all. So this is like a prosecution exhibit that I had in a case. So this is 2214 Newbold Avenue in the Bronx. And this little dot here, the yellow dot is where the actual robbery occurred. So there's a tower here. And they used the pie chart thing there, which many do. This was, an, this was the FBI. Um, and this was the prosecution exhibit saying like T-Mobile sector, this is when the crime occurred at this time and place. And here he was using this tower. Um, and that's all that they put into evidence. So what we did was look at the actual data. So this one with the bold is the one that they pointed to. That's the tower. There's another tower right here. 
These are all the other times in proximity to the time of the offense that our client's phone bounced off of that tower. OK, so this tower, and like in New York, obviously, like because it's such a dense urban area and so many um, people and buildings, towers are incredibly close together. So you can see there's a street here, there's a street here. So it's literally one block away. And as you previously learned, towers, the cell phone doesn't necessarily go to the closest tower. So because there's all these calls, it doesn't mean that like our client was here when he used this tower. He could have been here, and it, everybody else in this vicinity might have been trying to use that tower. Or he was standing like behind something that the cell phone didn't like, and it went to that tower. It doesn't mean anything at all when you see it in the context of all of the calls and all of the pictures. But this, the prosecutor won't give you this. You have to get your, this was done by a paralegal. We didn't have, this was not done by an expert. We had a paralegal pull the actual, just the um, cell data and the tower information and just go through and plot these on a Google map. Um, it's time consuming. You don't want to do it, but a paralegal can do it. This doesn't require expertise. This is literally just mapping all of the other times around the offense when our client's phone was in the exact same area. So now it went from, you know, oh, he's guilty, he was here, to screw yourself, he's always there. Um, he lives in the area, he goes by there. What else is there? So here's another one. <laughs> I just wanted to show you because somewhere in here, one of these was on a prosecutor um, exhibit to demonstrate that, again, our client committed an offense here. Um, these are all, it was a conspiracy. So we mapped all of the conspirators' phone calls and when they used that tower. Um, if this tells you anything about anything, uh, you're smarter than I am. Because basically this just shows, yeah, uh -huh, that's a location where they go. Um, and then, you know, you're you're done. But if you don't do this work, this prep work, you're not going to have this. All you're going to have is the one phone call at the time of the offense um, and nothing to cross the expert on. And so when you do your cross and the expert hasn't done this, you set it up by talking about that. You know, did you look at other calls? Did you map how many times they're in that area? Did you do that? Where are those? Did you create that as a demonstration? Did you do it? No. Why not? Well, I was only looking at the calls at that exact time. You know, that's what they're basically going to say. And then, you know, you can attempt to get this kind of thing in through that expert. You probably won't be able to. It's going to have you're going to have to complete your cross of that expert when you call your witness. And you say, "Look, he didn't do it because this is what it shows." That's why I asked those questions. So, understand the location as well. You know, maybe your client was in the location. Maybe it was one time. But what else is in the area, um, especially in cities? You know, cell towers, you, you see them when you're driving. You see the cell towers that like, look like trees. Um, you know, but those, you don't see those in Philadelphia because they're attached to buildings. They're here. And what that means is that there's other things in the buildings. There's other things in the area. There might be lots of reasons that your client was in the ba ba same basic area as a, as a crime and not have actually committed the crime. So you know, go to the area. If you're not familiar with it, go check it out. See what is in, you know, honestly, you can expand that area. Even in a, the good thing about like cell site location is that no expert will ever say, I know that that tower, you have to be within 200 feet. I know that you have to be within like 300 yards, whatever. They will never say that because they can't. So expand whatever your area is. If there's not like a 7-Eleven within 100 yards, but there's one in 300 yards, that's fine. Your client could have been at the 7-Eleven. It's totally fine. You can expand that area because they can't tell you that's not true. Um, again, location data on cell, cell sites is not at all specific. Um, and then we talked about. So this is, again, I just wanted to show you again, because this is an actual exhibit that they use. And um, 
it's correct. A lot of judges will actually have you um, have them take away this line and only put these two directional points. Um, question whether you actually want that or not. It depends on what the evidence is in your case. Because you know, if they put it, like, if they do this, and like this one, where it's like basically on the line, and they're saying that's as far as he could have been, you know, and you're like, OK, but what if he was right here? This is just like two feet away. It means that he wasn't using that tower. He wasn't standing there. Um, whereas if it's an open line, it sort of gives the impression that it can go on forever. So just uh, think about how your actual image is going to be perceived by the jury before you decide whether you want to challenge that line. Um, so, but that, you should get these. And the most important thing is, though, that no, do not let a prosecutor um, just put the location of the cell tower. Because they will do that, too. They have to, at a minimum, have the directional bars. Because if they put the, just the cell tower, it gives the impression that you could be anywhere in this area. But the reality is, if, you, if the cell signal is on, in this sector, in this piece of pie, it means you were not, you could not have been back here. That it's, like they, it's like looking out the back of your head. Like that's the one thing that they will say for sure. They only look in one direction. Um, so if it's looking this way and the, you're, you know, the offense is over here and, you're, you know, and the, the prosecutor just wants to put the cell tower, I mean, you can be standing right here and making a call and you are not going to connect to that. So that, it's really important that they do put some direction on it because if it's facing the wrong direction, you have to point that out. Now, those segments don't affect the direction of so well, what happens is that this single, so what is at the point here is the actual tower. This tower will have three more panels on it. But the actual, it, but they're counted as like, so it's like tower A, tower B, tower C. It's one tower that goes in all the directions, but it will only, you will only connect to one side of it. So if it's like, the point is like, if you're over here and you make a call, in all likelihood, you're going to connect to this, this same tower, but in this sector. So you have to know what sector you're in in order to know which direction you're going. Mm -hmm. um, so again, it's not, it is, it's not science. It is a, it's just information that your phone connects about you and your phone calls. It's location data. And it, all that it is is mapping the data and the data points. So you can't, it is generally accepted because it's just facts and data. It's not like, it, you, there's not an interpretation generally of science. So you're very unlikely to keep cell site location out. Um, but it's also, again, not a precise location. And one of the things that you want to do, again, expanding your view, when you get those like thousands of pages of like call data, what you, one of the things you want to do is like look for jumps in cell tower locations. And what I mean by that is um, it will connect, a phone will connect to the closest tower. You want to look at where the call started and where it ended. Because they will not always be the same tower. And it doesn't mean that the person moved. OK? You also might get one that starts somewhere and ends really far away. Um, and when you map those out, you know like physically, I could not have gone that far. Like for us, I've seen this in cases where you're connected to a tower that's on like the West Side Highway in Manhattan. Um, and a few minutes later, you're connected to a tower that's across the water in New Jersey. And it's because it's a straight open shot across the river. And the connection was better. It's not because as you were like driving up the West Side Highway, you suddenly like flew. Um, and those things are important because you can point out, like if you find one or two of those where your cell signal jumps from the beginning of call to the end of a call, it's a really, really, really easy way to demonstrate to the jury that you don't always connect to the same one. You don't connect to the closest one. You can say, look, it, during this call, he went from 
x point to y point. You're not actually arguing that he moved from there to there during the course, and the duration of the call is on there. It can be like a, look at, for like a 30 second call that starts in one place and ends in another. And you know you physically could not have gone from one place to the next, but the call itself jumps. And you, that is the, it's just the easiest way to physically demonstrate to the jurors what you're talking about when you say the actual location, it doesn't correspond to your physical location. Yeah? Yeah, you get them. It's all so. I don't know that they're technically public record, but they're very easy to obtain by subpoena. Um, so when you and I'm sorry, I don't have this, but I know Larry had it up when he had the um, like the the actual caller information that you get with the columns of numbers and information. The last one is actually like it's the name of the tower, but like when you get that, when you subpoena like or you're given the call data information. The name, the actual like name and number of the tower, isn't going to tell you anything. You actually have to get like what is a functionally a key from whatever provider it is. So if it's Sprint, you need to contact Sprint, and they will send you their like location data of their actual towers. This is all on the internet. Um, that may exist. Don't, nest, don't, as usual though, I would say if you are going to present it in court or give it to your expert, don't trust something you just downloaded from the internet. Um, make sure that it's like, you know, you're getting, you subpoena so that you can show that these are real records and that you got it. Because you don't want, you, the last thing you want to do is hand something to your expert, tell them to like base their opinion on it. Or you know, cross somebody, cross an expert on something that you found, and they're like, "Yeah, no, that's from 2014. Here's the real one." Um, you know, you just don't want that to happen. So make sure you're getting like the actual, like the real information, and that it is that you can show that you got it from the company. Um, in terms, of, I say that in terms of making sure you have these things for court, and that is very important. But in terms of preparation and other things, by all means. Get information from wherever you can get it. If you can get a listing of the cells and they are, it, it says it's accurate and it appears to be, in the meantime, use it. Um, so s location data, because it is not accurate, um, you might be able to challenge it with other information that is in your phone. Um, like what is tracking in the actual phone? Like your client, when you get your client's phone, um, Google Map tracking, Again, as, as I said earlier, you might want to keep this out, and you can challenge the science, but you might want it in. You might want to use it on cross, because the Google map tracking is GPS-based and tends to be much more accurate than like where the cell towers are. Um, so if you have Google Maps on your phone, and if you, not have you, if you just turned it on and didn't go in and manually change the settings, your phone is tracking you. Um, and it's quite accurate. This um, was me yesterday. I started here, which is my house. I drove over the George Washington Bridge, down 95, and into Philadelphia. And you can zoom in on any of this and see you know, exactly where I was. Um, and then I, when I look at this, this is my home address. Um, this is where we stopped for gas. Um, this <laughs> is where we went to dinner. It was delicious. Um, but you know this is and this is in my phone, and that's the standard settings. And it's like just all you have to do is take out your any your client's phone, your phone, click on the little button that on on the left of the search bar in Google Maps, and it will say to you like tracking settings timeline, and it tells you exactly where you have been. It tells you you know your phone knows how many steps you took. The reason it knows that is because it's tracking you. Um, and 90% of our clients have not turned this feature off. Did you print that directly from your phone? Yeah, that's a screenshot of my phone. Do you have an iPhone? No, uh-uh. Yeah, that's a Galaxy. 
This is a Galaxy phone. It's Google Maps. I didn't, I mean, it's not that I wanted it to track me. I just uh, didn't turn it off. And, it, you know, every time, you, like, an app is like, uh, we need location services, and you click allow, this is what you're allowing your phone to do. Um, so it's like, you know, there, what, this? This is just a screenshot. On a phone? You just click the, the power and the volume at the same time. Hold them down. It will screenshot the phone. So this is a screenshot of my actual phone yesterday. Um, and you can do this with your client's phones as well. I mean, sometimes we've used this to like get, them, get the prosecutor to dismiss a case. We had, a, fairly recently, a guy who they were you know, putting into the grand jury. Um, on very serious attempt murder charges. Uh, he was like, I was in New Jersey. I'm telling you, I was in New Jersey. And like that, uh, we all know how far an alibi goes. But we pulled his phone, and with like a $100 program, you can do a basic copy of your client's phones. Um, you can't get any of the hidden data or anything else. It's only live data. But it will copy like cell site locations too, and in an admissible format. Or you can have an investigator sit down, open it up, take screenshots as he goes, and write an affidavit about what they did to like, make a foundation for this information. But we did this with like, Google Maps of where our client was with his phone at the time of the crime, and he was in New Jersey. We gave it to the prosecutor, and they dismissed the case. So these things can be used. They can also be used you know, if my phone says that at 434, from 4.34 to 5.02 p.m., I was at the Richard Stockton stop on the New Jersey Turnpike South. Um, and my cell site location is four miles away, and they're trying to claim I was four miles away. You know, a jury, at least, is going to trust this significantly more. If you have to call an expert you know, to challenge their cell site location by putting in this information, you can do that as well. But most of this stuff you can get in with investigators or with paralegals, and juries trust it because they have it on their own phones and they see it. How about Fitbits? Uh, recently, some kid was able to locate all the special forces in the third world countries by somehow tracking their, uh, when they were, when they were mm -hmm. logging their runs and stuff like that. Yep. Okay. Fitbits have location service. Your car has location service. Your phone does. Fitbits do. All of those things that are able to track like, your movement and your fitness, which I believe is why Google knows if you're going to have a heart attack or not, because they know, <laughs> they know where I ate. <laughs> they, know that I they know that I was there from 5.53 until 9.11, so they know that I also had wine. Um, <laughs> you know, Google knows that I'm, I'm aiming for a heart attack by sitting in my car and then sitting at a restaurant for three hours. Um, so these are the kinds, I think this information is stored, and it's stored because they want to sell shit to you. That's why they do it. But it's all there, and it's all readily available. And you should be using these things to cross the experts when they're using, like, you know, some cell tower somewhere. I got a question there. Yeah. The, the case that you just talked about that you were able to persuade the prosecutor not to go mm -hmm. to the grand jury with your client by showing the phone. His phone was there. Something else was being used, though, to put him at the scene of the crime. Now, I'm thinking that that's got to be eyewitness testimony or something else. No, no, no. An angry ex was saying oh. it was him. <laughs> An angry ex was saying it was But that's the thing. It's not, don't think of whenever you get anything from a cell phone, remember that there's a lot more on the phone. So if they're saying, we're going to do cell site, Go into the, into the maps, go into the tracking, go into the text. You want to look at all of it, because that particular client was texting the person he was meeting. We didn't just give the map. We were like, this is what he was doing. Here's who he was talking to. Here's the substance of the text. Here's the Google map. This is what happened. You know, this is like, you know, alibis have historically been terrible defenses, because you can't prove it. But you now can. Your phone is tracking you. Between your phone and your credit cards and like all the cameras and all the land, alibis are actually useful defenses. You just have to be able to find the information to prove it. You don't have to rely on like your grandma anymore. Um, How do you, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. I'm stuck on the authentication process with respect to that Google map and all the other stuff. You don't so, have to call Google to say, yeah, 
that's a captured screenshot from one of our programs from this type of device. So how do you get it authentic if your paralegal was able to and then what challenge? No, so with like things like this, with Google Map, the prosecutor generally won't think to challenge it. <laughs> they they typically don't. Like if you say it's the same way like if you're like want to put in an area they're going to challenge you on the actual map. All right, so I mean, the only way that you can do it, uh, you're never going to be able to without Google to prove the science behind how this was tracked. But they, they may challenge who had the phone, who did what, where it was. And those are things that you can generally overcome. Um, you can also convince a judge that it goes to the weight of the evidence. If they're going to say, like, it wasn't, how do you know they had the phone? That's the weight of the evidence. It's not the admissibility. So if you're going to basically, when you get the phone and you say it's stored, this is, you get an investigator who will like either cop can copy the phone or can just basically go through and you know track the history, print it out, do whatever you need to do, depending on how cranky you, you generally you want to keep the phone and you want to let them examine it. And if they're going to say no, it's not in the phone or you made it up or something else, let them challenge that and try get a hearing on that. You know, if they're going to say, what, you created this map? You drove the phone to somewhere? Um, they've already gone in and did what they need to do to get rid of the shit. So that's, that's, excuse me, sir. No, no, please. I'm not delicate. Um, but it's, um, you know, it, it is really generally pretty easy to get Google Maps, Google tracking, anything that's on the phone into evidence. Um, you know, and they will. The same way that like it's actually very difficult to get like proof that a Facebook picture is what it says it is, but like judges will let it in if somebody's like, yeah, that's me. I recognize the other person in the picture, just like anything else. I put it on Facebook. I saw it there. Like they judges will let the stuff in. Is there a hand raised in the back? Yeah. Not, it's not as easily accessible. So the things that are like two clicks away are based on, you know, they're all on on your phone unless you physically turn them off. I don't pretend to be an expert. If you turn them all off, I don't know like how you can actually go in. Like these things are like, okay, my phone says this is where I was. You know, these are what, I, how long I was there and when I stopped and what I did. Um, and you can at least have that as a starting point. But no, if it's all off, it, you know, this doesn't exist. Like the easily accessible printout. Um, so I just want to move quickly to cell phone forensics. We could talk about cell phone forensics for 12 hours and never get into like the depth of it. So I just want to focus on Celebrite and mostly on the discovery that you should be getting. Because again, Celebrite, you often don't get all of the discovery. Usually what they send you is this first thing the extraction summary report, like a PDF. Sometimes it's in an HTML. Um, and this is actually generated by the software that's controlled by the um, investigator who runs the Celebrite search. Um, do not settle for this. You must have this. But that is not all that there is in Celebrite <laughs> Discovery. Um, you also want the uh, summary report which is usually just like a typewritten description of the request of the search performed. And there's a reason that matters, is because Celebrite is not like a turn it on, turn it off thing. It is very controllable. You can, they, um, the investigator can control what type of search they run, what they're looking for, how long they're going back, what they're planning to download. So you need to know. Um, what the actual search was and what they were looking for. Um, then there will be handwritten like lab notes usually that they take, um, just like what it sounds like. Like as they're going through things, the detectives, um, the investigator usually writes stuff down. Make sure you request it. If they say they didn't write anything, there's not much you can do, but they usually do. Um, forensic mobile phone submission form. That's a request by the DA to the technician. Um, and it will give you more information, too. It'll tell you what the DA is actually looking for, um, which can be very important. Even if it doesn't 
change your cross of that particular investigator, it might help you hone your theory of the case if you know what the DA has been looking for in your client's phone. Um, grand jury minutes, if the investigator testifies, obviously you want to get those as well. Um, a lot of the times there's a combination of arresting officer and technician who talk about where things were and what happened and why things are important. Um, there's a search warrant typically, you need to get that. And the basis, the affidavits for the search warrants. Um, and they always take photographs of the device, so make sure you get those too. Um, now, what can be extracted? There's the two main types, live data and hidden data. Um, live data is the things that you see on your phone. Um, SMS, MMS, video, email, etc. So whatever apps and things you have on your phone, the like live information that you're either putting in or receiving, that's the live data. Um, and then hidden data is what you typically can't see. Your web history, your picture data, um, your email headers, that kind of thing. There's a ton of information on your phone that you can't see um, and most users can't see. And they can extract one or both. Um, and you want to know what they were looking for and what they extracted. Because sometimes, like, I have a case right now where there's a, a, photo, a particular photograph that the complainant says my client took is important. Um, but my client says she took it like a week before and she was, that's why the complainant was mad at her. The complainant says she took it at the time of the offense. So the photograph exists. We all agree it exists. What I've gotten in discovery is the photograph. Um, but what we need is the picture data. The information that shows demonstrates conclusively when that picture was actually taken um, and whether it was taken on the phone that it was found on. Um, so you have to do a separate search for those and you have to make a request for that data. And sorry, you can imagine, again, why these things actually matter when you're doing your cross. Because if, you, if they did a search for hidden data and you have all of this information and your client, like they're coming in and trying to put in all of these things that seem really damning about your client and it's all from hidden data and it's like things that were sent, like background images, other things that were sent that were not generated and maybe not ever seen by your client, it makes a really big difference. Um, almost every offense requires some knowledge or intent or something else. And there's a lot of things on your phone that you don't know are on your phone, and your clients don't know are on their phone. And you need to be able to understand the difference and be able to cross the um, investigator about what those are and where they came from. Um, so these are the two ways that you get the data and what you want to ask for, just so you understand the terms. A logical image extraction is all the live data. This one is very common. So you'll just, when you get all the text messages your client's ever sent, all the like penis photos he's ever sent to his girlfriend, um, that's what they're doing, live data. Um, but when they do the file system extraction, um, it's actually a copy of all the live files and all the hidden data so that you can challenge whether or not those photos were actually his or somebody else sent them around. Um, So what was extracted and what was reported? Now the investigator, again, can control what they do with the Celebrite. So they can control, even if they're saying, I want live data, they can limit that to SMS. Um, so if you just get text messages, there's a whole bunch more that they could have looked for. And if your client, if you have seen your client's phone, if your client's saying like, yeah, that text, but it was in the context of, and there was like these photos, and there's other things. You need to make sure that you find out what they actually search for and get the rest of it if you need it. Um, because also, like my phone, like an Android phone, if you're on an SMS and then you send a photo, it turns that it's an MMS. It t turns as an MMS. That's how it sends. Group messages on um, an Android send as an MMS, even if it's all in your text function. They don't all come out as text as SMS. Um, so if they don't do a search for SMS and MMS, you're not going to get all of those. Um, you know, if you're having a conversation that's half on text, and then you're like, oh, I'll send you the video, and you switch to WhatsApp, 
you know, and then you start texting on WhatsApp, the, co the relevant context might be somewhere else. And you got to make sure that you find it. Um, or if they didn't find it, you know, sometimes you know there's a whole bunch of other stuff on your client's phone that you didn't want them to find, and you're happy they didn't. But once they're on the stand, you can cross them on the fact that they didn't look for anything else, that they didn't look at the bigger context. They only did text. They only did whatever they wanted. And make it sound like you know, they were biased. They weren't looking for the full picture. They were only looking for what made your client guilty. Um, they also, the investigator can control the time frame. So they might look for, you know, if your, your crime happened on whatever, October 1st, they might do an extraction that is like September 1st to like, you know, October 2nd, so that they have everything for the month leading up. But there might be a whole bunch of stuff that is good and useful and helpful before September that they didn't look for, that you might want. So make sure you know the time frame. Don't assume that it's just that they looked for everything relevant or did a full dump of your entire phone. Um, and so you want to do, in the report, they will generally say what time frames were there, what they looked for. Make sure you look through the report, understand what the limitations were that were placed on it. And if, it's, you know, if there's things in there that you want, you think, get that information. If not, save it for cross and cross them on the fact that they limited their searches. Um, so, the, and again, the control by the investigator can impact your case. Um, if there's any missing data, if your client communicated over multiple forms, I talked about this a little bit, but make sure that you understand like what all is on the phone. Um, you know, and many of the, you won't get a full picture. Like, I mean, I go back and forth from like text to WhatsApp all the time, and like WhatsApp is encrypted and text isn't. Um, so you're going to see like half of my texts readily, like, are readily available if you search my phone, but what, you won't get the WhatsApp. Um, so you want to make sure that you understand what, made, what forms your client was using. What's going to tell me that they limited the search? The report will say what they actually searched for. Okay. So you need to understand all of the potential possibilities. So if they just say like SMS, MMS, email, and you're, you, have, you always want to look at the actual phone. And if you just simply open the phone and you see that there is like Slack, WhatsApp, you know, and multiple other communication forms, Facebook Messenger, whatever else is on the phone, you know, people communicate all day long on like Instagram chat. You know, if they didn't pull those, if they didn't look at those, you know, there might be a lot of context out there that is missing and could be helpful to your client. Well, you say that, that they always take a photograph of the phone, are they taking a photograph of every screen that has all the icons on it? I mean, like, you could, you'd have to go five mm -hmm. or six screens to see the icons, to see the apps that I've got on my phone. Right. So, no, you need to see the actual phone. OK. They usually will take a photograph of the physical phone. Most of the time, it's not even on. Um, just to demonstrate, usually serial numbers and other things, and to show that they actually had the phone. Um, the photos of the phone are almost irrelevant, except you know if they if your client says I had three phones or like I had a like gray like you know Galaxy and they have like a black like iPhone, um, you know then the actual phones matter and like what the pictures are. But generally, it's just to prove like chain of custody and that's the appropriate phone. But you need to go sit down with the investigator, preferably with your expert, and look at the physical phone because you want to know what's on it. Um, so qualifications, again, there are, for Cellbrite, there are um, four levels of certification. Um, you want to know what your expert actually has. For those in the back, the four levels of, um, and these are through Cellbrite, where you can get trained and um, certified. So there's beginner which is just the mobile forensic fundamentals online course. So if somebody says they've taken that, and that's what they quote, they won't say, I'm a beginner. They're going to say, I've ta I, I'm an expert. I've taken the mobile forensics fundamentals online course. And that, what that means is that they're a beginner. Um, and so you can highlight that. And that is as stated by Celebrite. Um, intermediate is there's a Celebrite certified logical operator. 
advanced Cellbrite certified physical analyst, and then the highest level is a Cellbrite certified mobile examiner, a CCME. So you should actually, any expert that testifies that isn't one of these, obviously point all those things out. Um, that that's what you can be to actually know what you're doing. I'm going to go very, very, very briefly into computer forensics. Um, know your audience. I love this movie, but I also love this image because this is the level of your judges 99% of the time. They do not know what is happening. Um, one of the things that you might try to do, and I have done it successfully, is basically <coughs> pre-trial. If there's computer forensics, you want to scare them out of, scare the judge out of letting them on the stand. You know, most judges want to think they're the smartest person in the room. And so if you challenge the computer forensics and you argue that it's going to be a trial within a trial and you set up and use your biggest words in the motions and in the hearings, get as complicated as you can, judges are usually like, Ugh, I don't think we should have that. <laughs> and they like will often let you get away with it. Um, but uh, you also do want to know your, <laughs> know your audience. Because when you get in front of a jury, once that witness is up there, um, you know, they are going to just be like, uh, most technical experts, even when they think they're dumbing it down, are just soaring over jurors' heads or boring the crap out of them. So it's your job to either to dumb it down if it's your expert or to take it apart in terms that the jury will understand. Um, so the thing that typically matters the most on computer forensics is whether your client knew the information was there. Whatever they search for and found and are trying to use against your client, you got to understand whether or not your client knew it was there. Um, so the basic, basic thing is understand a human search. Like where, whether somebody physically searched for it, whether it was like, like a Google, a Yahoo, a Bing, a YouTube. You know, if somebody actually physically searched and got a result, that is the most common way that you know that it was there. Or if it's like a program or something that's on a computer, obviously that is an issue unto itself. But if it's something else, your client might not have known it was there. And you need to understand that and highlight that. And that's what, one of those things that you want to do pre-trial. Because that's where your easiest like, trial within a trial comes from. Like if you can say to the judge, my client never knew this was here. And then you would go into a long speech about like URLs and cookies and searches and all of these things, the judge will get very confused. Um, but you also will confuse a jury. It's cookies. Those are good ones. The ones on your computer suck. Um, <laughs> They're, you know, these are just basic things that are stored without user knowledge. And when you want to explain these things to the jury, it's like, so like, you know, if they're trying to put in images or something else that were from a computer, from the computer, and you're like, my client never looked for this. You know, he wasn't, this isn't his, he didn't do that. You know, you want to explain it in a way the jury can understand. The most, like, the thing that happens to everybody, well, everyone who shops for shoes. Um, <laughs> like if you go on Zappos and you search like black boots, and then like a week later, you're on Facebook, every ad is for effing black boots. And you're like, oh, I already bought them at a real store. Um, and you can't, but you can't get away from the ads. Those are cookies. Those are, and people understand that because your computer like bombards you with things that you've searched for, with images and everything else. All of those images that your computer is sticking into ads on your Facebook are on your computer. They're stored on your hard drive. Um, oh, that's my time. So I just want to say, like, so this is like another one. And this is, again, like, if there are, you know, something like a sex assault case and they want to bring in, like, 370 pictures of, like, vaginas and other things and, like, looking all odd and use it against your client. You know, you want to look at things in conjunction with, um, with whoever else is using your, your, the, your computer. Maybe your client's wife surge symptoms, vaginal pain, which could happen and would not be a sexual assault thing. Um, and then all but two of the images are contained in cookies. 
you want to try and keep those out or at a minimum cross-examine on the fact that only two of them are real images. And those two real images were brought up, that came up after a direct search for these words. Um, so that they are now suddenly not evidence of anything. Um, and then don't forget the obvious. Who has access to the computer? Was the image of the sent to the person? Was it auto-saved or cloud? Um, and I just want to warn you guys to warn your clients. You know, WhatsApp is very, very popular. And it's popular for many reasons. You can send videos and like, pictures really quickly and easily. And all of your messages are also encrypted. Um, the common setting for WhatsApp, like when you download the app, if you don't change it, all of the photos and videos that are sent automatically save to your phone. So if you have like an iPhone and you have a WhatsApp, and somebody sends you a picture on WhatsApp, even if you didn't want it, um, it downloads to your phone. And then if your iPhone is on standard settings, it uploads to the cloud. And now it's yours forever. Um, so you know, be careful. Tell your clients to be careful. Um, but also, you can cross on those things. Because they, they don't have to prove that it exists. They have to prove that your client knew it existed. And that is a much, much harder thing to do. Thank you.